five-star generals in the United States Army. Every little once in the 34th President of the United States was a supreme commander, Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe during World War II. His West Point classmate of 1915, Omar N. Bradley, was the GI general in Africa, Sicily, Normandy, and on to victory in Germany. General Bradley has just returned from Vietnam. In the former president's office in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, we talked to Generals Eisenhower and Bradley about Vietnam. Would you say, Mr. President, that this is the most unpopular war the country's ever had? Well, I think in many ways it is. But remember this. We have not declared it a war, and therefore um, uh, all discussion can be very argumentative and, uh, and is completely free. But historically, look at the number of people that were killed in New York City during the Civil War in resisting the, ad the uh, draft. And um, there was a tremendous movement for peace in the North. And if what you aptly call the doves of that day, if they'd have had their way, we, we'd have been a fragmented uh, continent and certainly no nation like we are today. I had hoped that after moving through the town, you would have taken that hill. I didn't think it was practical. We were waiting well for many reasons. We marched all day and we'd fought, and the orders were to caution against bringing on a general engagement. There were reports of federal troops in the north, sir. We couldn't bring sufficient artillery to bear on that hill. We decided it was best to wait for another division. Uh, Johnson's. Yes, and Johnson didn't arrive till after dark, just a while ago. General Early, do you think you can attack on your flank in the morning? That hill will be a very strong position once it's fortified, which is what they're doing right now, sir. I am very much aware of that, General. Have you looked over the ground yourself, sir? From a distance only. I do not think we should attack this point. This will be the strong point. Our troops have marched hard and fought hard today. I suggest we hold here while the rest of the army attacks the other flank. Well, here we armchair generals can certainly speculate what we might have done in general these circumstances. Clearly Cemetery Hill is indeed the key to the enemy's position and Culp's Hill is the key to capturing at this late point 
in the game Cemetery Hill. And recognizing that is so, from a military, a strictly military point of view, we might think it better to have placed Heath, Heath's division, which was fairly chewed up as a consequence of the hard days fighting on the 1st, to take the place of Rhodes' division and put Rhodes' division in support of Johnson and Early to concentrate an attack on the forces that have just, within the last few hours, occupied Culp's Hill. And we need to do this immediately. We need to do this at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., no later, 6 a.m. And we need at the same time to use Longstreet's two divisions, Hood and McLaws, in place of Pender and Anderson to attack directly across the eastern face of the town northeastward into the Second Corps trying to put as much pressure as possible on both sides of the hairpin at its neck. That's what we got to do. Using Pender and Anderson to support Longstreet. Now why this didn't happen this particular choice didn't happen. No one can reasonably say because the objective evidentiary record is grossly ambiguous. There just isn't enough reliable, credible evidence provided by recipient witnesses that we can rely upon to understand why General Lee didn't command his army to do this. Now, one explanation is obviously Longstreet. This is clearly not a cooperative command relationship existing here at the top of the chain. This is not Eisenhower, Omar Bradley, and George Patton cooperating together. Eisenhower being in essentially the shoes of General Lee, Bradley and Patton being in the shoes of Stonewall when he was alive, and Longstreet. Now the situation is Yule, Hill, Longstreet. And of these three, Longstreet clearly has the dominant personality and he has the most efficient core. He has to be the general that Lee relies on to carry out, to execute orders and this is something that the evidence clearly demonstrates Longstreet was not willing to do. Now, one explanation for Longstreet's attitude in this situation is that he simply looks at the numbers, counts up the regiments and the brigades, and accepts the reality that his side of the field is heavily outnumbered. So, 
keep in mind, too, that this is the first time Longstreet's called upon to mobilize his forces to attack the enemy frontally. You go back over his history, students. He appears during the seven days commanding a division. He uses that division along with the rest of General Lee's command to attack Beaver Dam Creek, a position the enemy gives up readily to fall back to a prepared position at Gaines Mill, Boatswain's Creek, a position that General Lee attacked incessantly, vigorously, for eight to ten hours. And in those eight and ten hours, Longstreet was not engaged. Longstreet's division got engaged in that battle only at the last minute coming against Porter's left flank at a time when the frontal assaults at Hill and Stonewall and D.H. Hill and, and several other divisions had been throwing themselves against had collapsed. Then you have Malvern Hill, where Longstreet did not participate significantly. That takes us to Second Manassas, when John Pope makes a serious, negligent error in ordering Fitz John Porter's corps to move from protecting his left flank to going down the pike directly in an attack against Stonewall's front. And it's that fact that General Lee seized upon to order Longstreet to advance. And so Longstreet is now, for the first time, advancing in an attack in a situation where his enemy commander has basically opened the door. That brings you to Antium where Longstreet was in a defensive mode. And then to Fredericksburg, where Longstreet was in a defensive mode. And then to Chancellorsville, where Longstreet appears at the end of the battle. And from there, we reach Gettysburg. So, in Longstreet's mind set, what we have here is an intention, an attitude to delay bringing on the attack as late as possible. Because in calculating his numbers, he recognizes he has about three hours worth of fighting that he can sustain. And he wants the end of that three hours to be at, <clears throat> at nightfall as a protection. And that's why we're simply not going to be able to move him to our will at dawn which is absolutely critical to the success of our action on the second. Now we come to the most difficult situation to understand 
why what happened on the third day happened. And we have very little hard evidence to go by. The prime piece of evidence is General Lee's official report dated July 31, 1863. In other videos, you can recall that I've 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 uh, pointed out that the the second report that exists in the official records of the rebellion that has a, an ambiguous date quote, January 1864, unquote, is in fact something that Charles Marshall manufactured after the war for his own personal agenda and which he caused to be slipped in the historical record in 1869 through the services of a reporter from the New York Times named Swenson. And so that report and its context contents must be ignored. What we have is General Lee's report of July 31, which we know is authentic. We know that it was actually filed with the War Department in Richmond because the text of it appeared in the Richmond daily newspapers in November of 1863 and is available for any of you to find in the digital databases that exist. And this particular clip from a much larger report is what needs to be focused on if we're in a trial court and General Lee is on the stand being cross-examined. He tells us, quote, Longstreet succeeded in getting possession of the desired ground, unquote. He's referring to the peach orchard that Sickles had occupied with the Third Corps. Quote, Ewell also carried some of the strong positions which he assailed, and the result was such as to lead to the belief that he, and we have to assume the pronouns referring to Yule, not Longstreet, that he, Yule, would ultimately be able to dislodge the enemy. You see, the Cemetery Hill is clearly the key point in the enemy's line, which, if taken, causes the entire line to become untenable. <clears throat> and what Lee is referring to somewhat generously is the fact that at the close of the second day, Johnson's division was able to occupy some rough fortifications that the 12th Corps infantry had thrown up during the day but had abandoned when they were called to uh, the left flank of the enemy line to support the repulse of Longstreet. Quote, These partial successes, Longstreet's capture of the Peach Orchard, Ewell's capture of the lower portion of Culp's Hill determined me to continue the assault next day. <clears throat> now remember, as a reasonable person in General Lee's shoes on the second day might envision the situation, attacking simultaneously both prongs of the hairpin near its neck was the most productive thing to do. And it was only because of Sickles' presence in the Peach Archers that 
induced General Lee to acquiesce in Longstreet's idea uh, of going around to get on to the flank of the enemy line on Seminary Ridge. So when he says the general plan is unchanged, he means this. He means, number one, it's Longstreet on the seminary, cemetery ridge side of the battlefield that is going to command the attack that's going to be made with his corps. And Lee intends Longstreet's corps to be supported by whatever troops Hill can produce, while at the same time Ewell, having reinforced Johnson's division with several brigades from Rhodes and Early, is going to continue the attack. So we're talking about attacking two points on parallel points of the enemy's lines with the idea of bending them enough that they can't protect Cemetery Hill any longer and they've got to retreat. And so if you give General Lee's syntax its natural meaning, it's Yule who General Lee is looking to to actually break through that is, attack and occupy via Culp's Hill, Seminary Hill, while Longstreet's effort against Cemetery Ridge is intended to fix the Second Corps, the First Corps, the Third Corps, and the 5th Corps, leaving Ewell to battle the 11th Corps and the 12th Corps. This is the only explanation for Lee's increase of strength for Johnson's division, although the increase, as General Schwarzkopf would tell you in his famous press conference, during the first Iraqi war, we need a much greater ratio of attacker to defender than General Lee is able to provide Johnson. Now we must confront the wonderland that Longstreet is living in. First, he, in his report, ignores the reality that I have uh, discussed in the video, the debacle of Pickett's Charge. He has totally ignored in his report the fact that he received orders from General Lee during uh, the night to attack with his whole corps supported by Hill, Cemetery Ridge, at the point occupied by the Second Corps, while at the same time, Ewell, who Lee is thinking of as his hammer, is going to exert the last possible breath of exertion to take Seminary Hill, Cemetery Hill. Longstreet's ignored this completely in his report because he has no intention of obeying the order. And he covers his disobedience by telling us that on the morning of the 3rd, our arrangements, our, the pronoun our 
refers to the ego, the id, and the superego in Longstreet's mind. Our arrangements were made for renewing the attack on my right, not by advancing against the Second Corps simultaneously as Ewell advances against the 12th and 11th Corps, but with a view in Longstreet's mind to pass around the hill? To quote, pass around the hill? Unquote. And to gain it, gain the enemy's flank, and reverse attack. Then he goes on to admit what he couldn't possibly deny in the company of intelligent officers. This would have been a slow process, probably, but I think not very difficult, unquote. And then you know from the debacle video what happens next with no attack coming forward, which results in Ewell not getting very far in his attack. And now there's a long, long pause of hours as General Lee rides across the battlefield to confront Longstreet and to try to get this army moving as one organism. Longstreet's got three divisions to move in column in a half circle, the circumference of which from point to point is about two and a half to three miles. He has to move artillery batteries, caissons, ammunition wagons, and he must have an ammunition train to support his batteries. There's only one road shown on the Adams County map for 1860 that suggests it would be available for use by Longstreet to get, quote, around the hill. How long is this going to take, General? Well, it's difficult, you tell us. Probably going to be slow and difficult. It doesn't seem rationally possible from a military perspective under the circumstances of the case. It seems frivolous. It seems silly. It seems simply as an excuse to put down in a report to mask what was going on in this gentleman's mind. Once he somehow gets, quote, around the hill, he's got to deploy And he's going to find himself essentially in a corridor, a a hallway. On his left flank is going to be the rocky hills, which are of no value to him whatsoever in terms of occupying. Big Round Top has no platform to plant artillery batteries on. It's completely wooded. Little Round Top has a very narrow platform that can barely handle the presence of six guns. How you're going to depress these guns to bring to bear is difficult to contemplate on either side. On Longstreet's right flank, he's got the ravine that Marsh Creek runs through, leaving him as a corridor to move northward 
up the enemy line of about a half a mile in width. And he's going to find confronting him without any question in a defensive position in successive order the 6th Corps, the 5th Corps, and the 3rd Corps. Absolutely ridiculous. A waste of energy, a waste of time, a meaningless exercise in a military maneuver. And what is happening when he does this? He has put himself in a position where he's isolated from the main body of the army. Blocked from reaching the main body by the 6th Corps, the 5th Corps, the 3rd Corps. Which in their aggregate is certainly sufficient on a defensive basis to hold Longstreet right where he is. Meanwhile, what is happening on the other side of the battlefield when Meade wakes up to this reality? He is going to throw the second corps supported by the first corps immediately toward Seminary Ridge to overwhelm the pathetic little pieces of Hill's corps that remain viable, capable of action, and battle them. While at the same time, the 12th Corps and the 11th Corps attack Johnson's division and Early's division. Ewell and Hill are now in serious danger of having to retreat toward the cash down gap, leaving Longstreet to fend for himself. Now, there's just no other rational way. I, yeah, I'd be shocked if military officers with rank, experience, and intelligence, graduates of West Point, would be contradicting the conclusion reached here. So, given the fact no reasonable officer in Longstreet shoes would have seriously entertained the plan of going around the Rocky Hills on July 3, what was going on in Longstreet's mind? He simply rejected General Lee's order to attack simultaneously with Ewell at dawn because it was going to be dawn. And the day was going to be very long. And he did not think it prudent. He took it upon his shoulders to conclude it was not prudent. And therefore it was not to be done. Because the strength of the army would be dissipated well before night fell. Now, in the very next sentence of his report, this is what he tells us General Lee's response was to his refusal to obey his first order. Here the disconnect continues between Longstreet and Lee. Longstreet, with this sentence, is telling the reader, is asking the reader to believe that General Lee changed the basic nature of his original orders which were for Longstreet to attack, supported by Hill. As Longstreet writes it, it's now a column of attack to be formed with two divisions of Hill's Corps 
and one division of Longstreet's Corps. But Hill isn't to command it. Longstreet is to command it. And the suggestion is, that's it. There's this column of attack with no support from other infantry units. Now, this is simply not acceptable. It's not rational. Why would General Lee want to do it one way, one moment, and when he finds Longstreet whining, decide to do it a way that clearly, objectively, cannot result in anything other than a debacle. How does it further General Lee's strategic objectives? How does it accomplish anything from a military point of view? The answer is, it can't, which means General Lee did not intend for Pickett's charge to come out as it did. He expected Longstreet to use Hood and McLaw's divisions to support the column of attack just as he expected Ewell to support the column of attack. Now, did Longstreet do more than act as a passive player here? Or did he actively undertake to sabotage the necessity, the objective necessity of his committing Hood and McLaw to action. To answer that question, you need to dig in a obscure, ambiguous a record full of holes and manufactured documents to establish the fact that explains why the Army's reserve and munition train, which is necessary to be present at the front, from which the caissons had to travel back and forth from the regimental ammunition wagons to the guns to keep the ammunition supplied, who is responsible for giving the order that moved that reserve ammunition train from the place that the Army's artillery chief, Pendleton, had put it? Who did that? Now, if in the dynamics of the moment it becomes clear that the artillery batteries that are clearly supposed to move forward with the infantry and support at least the column of attacks flanks cannot move because they're out of ammunition and they're out of ammunition because the caissons are empty because the regimental ammunition wagons are empty and because no one can find the reserve ammunition train Is Longstreet responsible for this as a means, as an excuse to hold up his hands and say, hey, it's not appropriate to send forward Hill, send forward Hood and McLaw. That's an issue left for you to resolve.
Perhaps it does indeed come down in the end to General Lee. The man just wouldn't leave until he'd thrown the last man into the fire to do nothing else if nothing else could be done but paralyze the will of the enemy to assume the offensive and counterattack. Bring me a little water now Bring me a little water, Sylvie Every little once in a while Bring it in a bucket, Sylvie Bring it in a bucket now Bring me a little water, Sylvie Every little once in a while